Hello everybody, um, or the four or five people who, who watch these videos. Um, I was working on my article for um, part 3b of my examination of the book Rethink yesterday and I came across a quote from a gentleman uh, named Daryl Gruder um, in this book. He op uh, Brad Briscoe opens up chapter 3 with this quote from from Daryl. Um, Professor Guter uh, talks about apostles and uh, their role in the church. So I decided to do some digging before I wrote any further and so I spent a good portion of the day yesterday researching what apostles were so I wanted because I wanted to make sure that my understanding of ap the apostolic office uh, of what apostles are was right. I listened to uh, an, a lecture by Dr. Guter uh, uh, three or four times maybe. I wanted to make sure I was capturing everything he was saying, that I was representing him or understanding him fairly. And one of the things that I discovered was um, my concerns initially for uh, what I had heard from the SEND Network and from Briscoe about apostolic authority were, were well founded. Um, I'm going to play uh, probably the majority of this lecture or this uh, speech that Dr. Guter gives to a group called, I want to say, how do they refer to themselves? Fresh Expressions. Um, he gives this lecture to a group at uh, here in the United States called Fresh Expressions. They have their um, uh, foundation in the uh, same named group out of uh, Great Britain. Um, they are very much progressive and what Dr. Guter says, or Gutter, it's G-U-D-E-R, so and he's a professor at Princeton. What he has to say uh, about apostles and what it means is, is pretty disturbing. So I'm going to play this now. Uh, I hope that you guys will hear what I'm hearing. I also hope that the comments that I make will will be helpful and useful, and that they'll be seasoned with um, scripture. And my desire is not to cut this man down uh, as less than a hum human or somehow inferior to me, but it is to warn the church that anything that's being put out by uh, the SEND Network, SEND Institute, um, Daryl Guter, um, Brad Briscoe, it, it's a danger. It, it's calculated and, and it has an end goal that is not uh, the preaching of the true gospel. So here we go. You are listening to the Fresh Expressions U.S. Podcast, a resource for pioneering leaders exploring new ways to be the church. Visit us at freshexpressionsus.org. assumption in this area, what I'm really doing here in this workshop is talking about some of the fundamental convictions of what we call missional theology, which has been a theme with which I've been associated since we published the book in 1998 uh, called Missional Church, A Theology for the Sending of the Church in North America. And what is exciting for me as I've been working on this theme is in the last several years to discover that the theological process that has gone on in, in Britain that has generated the Fresh Expressions movement is in virtually every single point complementary to, if not overlapping, the kind of theological approach our little network has been developing in this point. Complementary to, if not overlapping, the kind of theological approach our little network has been developing in this country. So it's a source of great encouragement to discover this kind of theological and ecclesial confirmation coming from one of the most unlikely sources in the world, the Church of England which is not what I would have ever expected. 
Uh, and so I'm excited about discovering more of this. It, I can hardly recommend Mission Shaped Church, the book that uh, uh, Bishop Graham uh, chaired. That the chapter in there on the theology of the Mission Shaped Church is a really first class document to work with. Uh, in my first sentence, I talk about witness as the central concept. I understand witness both as corporate and personal. There's a very strong emphasis in the missional theological discussion on the character of the entire congregation's public witness. That's how does the congregation as a body display to a watching world the character of the gospel? Very thin shaped church, the book that uh, uh, Bishop Graham uh, chaired. That the chapter in there on the theology of the Mission Shaped Church is a really first class document to work with. Um, in my first sentence, I talk about witness as the central concept. I understand witness both as corporate and personal. There's a very strong emphasis in the missional theological discussion on the character of the entire congregation's public witness. That's how does the congregation as a body? display to a watching world the character of the gospel. Uh, this is very much the, you want to come in Steve? This is, this is the, the leader of the California faction, Steve Yamaguchi, <laughs> who is the, the uh, executive of the Presbytery of Los Ranchos. Um, one of the basic commission, convictions I wrote here of the Missional Church Initiative is that it is the sacred task of every gathered community. This term gathered community is the term we use, we borrow it from Karl Barth, uh, for the congregation in whatever particular configuration it exists. The fresh expressions are actually, in a sense, coming up with a, uh, an incredibly broad definition of what congregation can look like because every, every fresh expression almost has its own distinctive way of being a gathered community. But what is true is that it's always a gathered community. So I think everything we're talking about applies really to every fresh expression. Uh, that it is the sacred task of every gathered community. I want to point out that they very rarely talk about the local church in this movement. Missional ecclesiology does not talk about the local church any more than, they, than it has to. And that's problematic because it, it's not recognizing, when it does that, it's not recognizing the, the, the true nature of the church, um, both local and universal. And so it just refers to the church as a gathered community. Now, we are the called out ones. We are the ecclesia. Uh, we are to gather together, but we're more than just a community. And that use of the, the language of community, um, also the, the use of it is stemming from something that's referred to as co communitarianism. Uh, communitarianism, let's see if I can... So it's communitarianism is a philosophy that emphasizes the connection between the individual and the community. Although the community might be a family unit, communitarianism usually is understood in the wider philosophical sense as a collection of interactions among a community of people in a given place, geographical location, or among the community who share an interest or who share a history. Um, communitarianism is um, secular. It is not uh, Bible-based. Um, it, it's philosophical, uh, it comes from, um, comes from a worldview that really is trying to, um, destroy the way the church talks about itself. I'm, I'm just going to throw it out there. And, and it is very much rises out of socialism and Marxism. So I think it's absolutely important for us to understand that as, as he goes forward and he talks about community. To be a corporate witness, that means as a group. You always have to remember that the, the New Testament is addressed to a plural you. It's addressed to communities and is only really properly read by a plural you. 
we need to be engaging and responding to scripture as community as gathered people of God so that sounds really close to the gathered church the the gathering of the ecclesia um, but notice the the plural you um, the letters the epistles in the New Testament were not just written to a plurality of people they were written to the church in every individual community whether it be the church in Colossae the church in Galatia the church in Philippi uh, and on and on so in some of the epistles were written to individuals and, and he doesn't really touch on that here uh, he, he just asserts a point and then he moves on uh, part of that's because he knows the, his audience agrees with him the other part of that is, is he's, he's trusting that anybody who hears this is not going to question the validity of what he's saying which in and of itself is problematic for the church today um, to be a corporate witness to the gospel in its context we had a, a good deal of emphasis from Bishop Graham on the importance of taking the context seriously and to equip every one of its members to live out that calling wherever God is sending him or her as Christ's witness. Uh, one of the great challenges that I find in working with the missional theological process is the relationship between the corporate and the personal. Uh, we, we are in all of us shaped by profoundly individualistic culture. I think we have a hard time engaging the gospel, engaging our He's really right here, and, and I agree with him on this. I, I'm not going to acknowledge that. There are going to be times and places where I agree with him. Uh, we are very much in the West, especially in the United States, a individual, individ, individualistic society. We uh, have rugged individualism as our um, kind of our go-to. It has made Western Christianity, and American Christianity especially, very much the thing that I do on my own. And that's problematic. And so I agree with him here, to a point. Vocation of witnesses as a community. Uh, our congregations, I think, now this is a bit of an overstatement, but our congregations focus on meeting the religious needs of their members. And, in fact, one of my great critics as a missional theologian of, of the ways we deal with mission is that mission is what you do once you've taken care of yourself. And when I, I see uh, presbyteries with mission committees, I look at what they do, what do they do? They pass out money to other people. It's a very thin definition of mission. And so what we're hearing in the Fresh Expressions discussion very much uh, agrees with the conviction in the missional church discussion that mission defines the very character of the church. It's, it's got to be defined in a very broad, inclusive way, and then it expresses itself in enormously diverse ways, uh, which what French Expressions beautifully demonstrates. These are the questions I think we need to be working on. How does the New Testament shape our understanding of the life and action of a witness? How does the gathered community equip such witnesses? How does that community fulfill its vocation to be a public witness before a watching world? There's that tension between individual and corporate. And how does this, um, what are some of the most powerful obstacles we encounter when we seek to be faithful to our vocation, our apostolic vocation? So that's uh, some of my... You hear that? Our apostolic vocation. Uh, that's going to become very important as this plays out. This is a, a good deal of what I spend time on, uh, what I'm uh, writing about and working on and looking for conversation partners. And it's, uh, it very much informs the, the courses that I have developed at, at, at Princeton. Um, why can we use the term apostle in reference to a Christian community or even to the individual Christian? And I'm going to argue that we should. Can we use the term apostle in reference to a Christian community? And he's going to make the argument that we should. And the argument he's about to make is where the problems really start to come in. Uh, the course, and, and I, I couple this with a, an attempt to rethink what we mean by apostolic and apostolicity. Uh, one of my students is writing his second, or he has his PhD already, and he's doing his German second degree, the habilitation, which is the degree you do in Germany to become a professor, and he's doing it on apostolicity. Uh, apostle, apostle simply means missionary. 
the, the, the concept of the apostle is a missionary who's, who, who's not only a sent one, but has a commission. So, catch that? An apostle is merely a missionary, and it has a concept of the one who is sent. So, yes, when you get to the very definition of the Greek word apostol, apostolos or apostoloi, to be sent, um, yeah, it does mean the sent ones, to, to send. So anybody who served as a messenger for any king or ruler or governor of a region, um, they were on an apostolic mission. They were sent. However, the church doesn't get to play with the word apostle, but the term or the title, the office of apostle, took on a very particular meaning for the church uh, as time went on. And so what Professor Guder does here is very dangerous, and it's, it's taking centuries of church history and church um, doctrine and dogma and, and it's that, that are intertwined and they're intermeshed and they have an understanding for the vast majority of people, especially within re the Reformed tradition, uh, who understand who the apostles were and that there was a very significant reason for them being called apostles. In fact, Ligonier um, makes it very clear um, that a proper understanding of the word apostle, I mean, it was not to be considered a perpetual office, that it was given to very select men those men had to have traveled with and learned directly from Christ in his earthly ministry. The one exception to that is Paul. But Paul goes on and he establishes his apostolic authority and he presents himself to the apostles in Jerusalem to be put on trial basically and to, to validate that he is an apostle of Christ. And so what prof the, the dignified professor does here is um, dangerous because it, it dismisses apostolic authority the way it should be handled and it gives apostolic authority to a group of people who do not deserve that title. And I don't want to say earned, but I literally mean deserve. We today do not deserve the title of apostle. And what he's going to do here is, is, is twist that up. And so, of course, the term apostolicity and apostle relates us all to the, to the original community of apostles. But I think it is very important for every Christian to understand that he or she has been drawn by God's Spirit into a history that began at Pentecost and which continues on. And every Christian is defined by that statement of our Lord, you shall be my witnesses. It's a plural statement, but it's, but it's, it, it's a plural that includes every individual. And Acts 1 and 2 captures that very nicely because you have this very corporate sense, you plural shall be my witnesses, uh, but you also have individual flames of fire on the heads of all of those gathered in the upper room. And you have the text saying that Peter, in, in chapter 2, standing in the midst of them said, so it's as though the, the Luke wants us to understand that Peter wasn't a soloist preaching, he was a spokesman. So we have to listen carefully there to what he says. He says that every single person, and this is the implication of what he's saying, every single person that was in the upper room in Acts on the day of Pentecost, when, when the tongues of fire descended from, from the Lord and uh, fell on these people, uh, every single person that had that tongue of fire was an apostle and therefore now we take part in that apostolic community because we too uh, have the Holy Spirit and, and notice the communitarian language of uh, the professor here he um, Peter spoke as as part of this group he was a representative he, he wasn't a solo artist uh, I don't think anybody would ever say that Peter was a solo artist but at the same time, Peter spoke with apostolic authority because he was one of the originals. You know, he had traveled with Christ. He, he was often um, in that inner circle. Uh, 
in ways that others weren't. And so Peter was speaking with a certain set of authority, um, or a certain type of authority, and that other people couldn't speak with. And so the, the professor is, is building up a presuppositional argument for his position. And he's, he's asserting, but he's not really relying on, on church history and biblical um, teaching for what an apostle is. And he's applying it to people who should not be taking it for themselves for the gathered and equipped community. So I, I'm, very, I'm very concerned that we, we work in our congregations uh, towards an understanding that we are defined by God's mission. What we heard today, we're defined by what God is doing in the world, where the Spirit is already at work. Jesus Christ already has all authority in heaven and earth. We don't take Jesus anywhere. We encounter Jesus already there. Um. This sounds really good. We don't take Jesus anywhere. We encounter him already there. The problem with that is, is yes, God is omnipresent. Uh, Christ is ruling and reigning from heaven. That much is true. But we don't go and encounter Jesus in an area. In other words, what he's really pushing us towards is what I diagnosed in in the very first uh, three videos that I did with on the interview with Brad Briscoe uh, from the Send podcast is this faulty idea of exegeting the culture. Uh, we're supposed to w move into a community the way these guys think and find Jesus already working there and that's not how it works. We move into a community, we preach the gospel and Christ does his work through the power of the Holy Spirit to save those who he is going to save and then Christ becomes present in that community, not in an incarnational way, but because he has come and the Spirit has indwelt those who are saved. And they then begin to go out from, from there and preach the gospel further on in these concentric circles out from wherever it is we're starting. So what he's doing here is very much uh, this exegesis of our exegetical approach to culture which is not what we're called to do we're not called to find Jesus in a community and then work with that uh, and and then as that is true of all of all of us uh, that we are represent, uh, representatives of Jesus Christ sent by him we continue that story that began at Pentecost in every place in which gospel is heard and responded to and uh, and I also want to make a point here. He says where gospel is heard and responded to. He, he does this a lot. He doesn't use the definite article, the gospel. He uses an amorphous uh, approach to it, gospel. So there is the gospel. We preach the gospel. We don't preach gospel. We preach the gospel. Uh, the gospel is the power of God to salvation. Is not gospel is the power of God to salvation. That is the. There's a very definite approach to the gospel. And they don't see it that way. <clears throat> the the development of fresh expression is so fascinating because it it really not only I think helps us understand the fundamental sentness of every Christian and every Christian community, but it also really mm -hmm. makes it important for us to rethink Catholicity. Because Catholicity has to do with centered diversity. The Church Catholic is not just universal, that's a very weak translation. The Church Catholic is the Church which is always the same Church about the same Gospel, but in an enormous, diverse variety of ways. All the languages spoken in Jerusalem the day of Pentecost is the symbol for that. So, my de desire is, is, is that every Christian leave worship, or whatever we, whatever we gather, with this sense I've got this little flame on my head and I've got this community that's sending me and I've been equipped because we've been together now the work, the apostolic work begins now the sentence becomes the agenda of one's life uh, for the other six days of the week uh, there's a Sabbath reclamation component to this whole mission discussion that we uh, many theologians are saying we need to reclaim Sabbath not for legalistic reasons but because we need to be a gathered community for our equipping, 
one-sixth of the time if we're going to carry out our vocation uh, the other six-sevenths of the time, the, 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 sort of the Monday through Saturday. Although since now we're gathering in all different kinds of days and Sundays, not necessarily the day we gather, you have to be open to all of those variations. There is a fundamental assumption that we're making in this. I want to touch so much on their downplaying of the importance of, of the Lord's Day. Um, but that's not why we're here. Discussion about the Christian movement as we see it uh, testified to in the New Testament. Uh, the New Testament is the testimony to, the attestation of, the record of, if you will, of the early apostolic mission. This is what this is what is the, the framework. And what is very clear from the entire reading of the New Testament, and I think this is actually true of the Old Testament, but I have to turn to my colleague Dr. McCrory to substantiate this because I'm not an Old Testament scholar and he is. Uh, the, the New Testament is, makes it very clear that the apostolic mission had a clearly defined goal, and it was not just saving souls. The apostolic mission, what... Did you hear that? The apostolic mission was not just saving souls. So, <laughs> the, the purpose of the church is not just the saving of souls. The, the chief purpose of the church is the glory of God, the worship of God. We exist to preach the gospel, to bring people into a place of worship of God. There's no way around that. But what he's doing right now, he's setting us up. It's to form witnessing communities. You shall be my witnesses. Now, you, a witnessing community is witnessing to something. And what it's witnessing to is Jesus Christ, which is the work of salvation. So obviously salvation is at the core of its existence. It's what the source of its promise and hope. There again, I would say the core of the existence of the church, not the community, the church, the, the assembling of the ecclesia, the, the core is the worship of God. The joy. But we have had over the history of the Christian movement this reduction of the understanding of the church's purpose to being the community that gets people saved. And I think the, the uh, fresh expression movement on the other side of the Atlantic and the missional theological discussion on this side are both really calling for a rethinking of such reductionisms. They really love to talk about how it's reductionism and um, it's uh, an issue of too small of a mindset and they, they actually like to use that word rethink a lot too um, if you know much about the Greek word repentance um, it is actually uh, better understood in a lot of times as uh, rethink uh, it's a shaping of our mind to think differently about ourselves uh, instead of thinking highly of us, ourselves we think more lowly of ourselves we consider ourselves inferior in position related to Christ um, and so they use the word rethink in a very calculated way I think that's why Briscoe chose the word rethink for the title of his book they want to cause the church to repent of how it's been doing things for for the last 2,000 years um, so it's very important for us to understand this uh, this reductionism that they're talking about is actually they're doing something they're doing something and that that what they're doing is actually deconstructionism they're coming in they're deconstructing the language of christianity um and and i don't think we should always speak in christianese i hate it when people do that all the time um but they're deconstructing de deconstructing the language of the church they're deconstructing the doctrines and the dogmas of the church uh, even within the reformed tradition for a very, very key purpose, and that is because they want to destroy the Bride of Christ the way as it is, has existed biblically for the last 2,000 years. By the same token, the, the, the point of the apostolic mission was the forming of witnessing communities, but it was not communities that existed for their own sake. Uh, so we get this constant emphasis, we heard it again today, both from 
There, there again, no, no sound church believes it exists for its own sake. So the professor is too smart by half. He's exposing himself here. He's, he's pushing against mega church Christianity. He's pushing against seeker sensitive Christianity. And ironically, what he's doing, he's is appealing to people who are in that mega church mentality because he's he's destroying the language of Christianity that appeals to people who hate the church and yeah and I I, I want to say I wish I could get him to see that but he already sees that I'm, I'm convinced that he sees that he knows full well what he's doing this is very calculated this isn't just he's uneducated and he doesn't know he's very well versed I'm sure in a debate he would clean my clock I'm sure he could cite church historians and church theologians and all sorts of passages of Greek New Testament scripture that I would never be able to do. But he's not a Christian. Well, then from Graham, the church is not the end in itself. Agreed. It's not the purpose of God's self-disclosure. It's the agency, the instrument. Leslie Newman would say the foretaste, the sign, the, the first fruit. And catch that, Leslie Newbigin, big in this missional movement, and he is a socialist. ...of God's healing mission that is uh, comprehensive, that is for all creation. So I often like to say we have to take att pay attention to the way that words like the world, or cosmos. So, here we are. The way we, we, we pay attention to the words like the world. Watch what he does with this. Actually work in the New Testament. For God so loved the world. We have yet to discover how big and how inclusive that claim is. So how big and how inclusive that claim is. Um, he's, he's not talking about this the way we are to understand the word world. Uh, in the New Testament when Jesus says that pas passage from John 3.16 and on. For God so loved the world. He's cosmos he's talking about all of created order he's not talking about a world just filled with people he's talking about god loved his created order and and then he demonstrates that love by how he sends his son and and he's he's really focusing on how myopic and small-minded the church has been in viewing the world and i would say that the true church has viewed the world properly what he's doing right now is he's turning the world into, um, in, we'll, we'll get there, you'll hear the language here shortly. Uh, it's a social justice construct. And that is our challenge, to be the agents of God's healing love for the world. There's enough work to go around. And the agents of God's healing work to the world. Yeah, if we take that seriously. So the the doctrine or the understanding of the church that comes out of this discussion is that the church gathered is gathered to be equipped for the vocation of every Christian which is witness when we're scattered. That this is the fundamental pattern of of the biblical of the, of God's people gathered uh, and gathered centrally around worship. So, there again, gathered centrally around worship. I, be I believe that is true, but he doesn't, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't see it quite the same way. And I also believe that we are gathered to, to preach. But he says witness, but he never gets down to talking about the gospel. That's what, that's what we're doing we're, when, we, when we're scattered. We're supposed to be about preaching the gospel. And he, he always says gospel, but he doesn't say the gospel and he misses it to encounter the healing presence of christ where two or three are gathered i'm in the midst of so he quotes from matthew 18 here and he says counter the healing presence of christ where two or three are gathered in the midst jesus wasn't talking about healing in that passage jesus was talking about church discipline and in the professor is not the only person in christendom who does this I hear this all the time. Well, we're having church because two or three of us are gathered. Oh, so you're disciplining one of the three of you out of the church? Is that what you're doing? So what happens when there's like four of you and the three of you gather, you kick the fourth one out. 
and then the other one does something, you need to kick him out. So then two of you gather, you kick him out, and now it's just the two of you and you disagree. Who's going to kick the other one out? Was he going to go get the other two that you just kicked out and form his own church kick you out? Because that's not what the church is. The, the, Matthew 18 is not talking about there being church because Christ is amongst them. Christ is amongst the church, yes. Matthew 18 is not, and he just abused that passage. Yeah. Gathered, I mean, you've already reformed at this point, gathered around the Lord's table, which I think we should be doing every Sunday, in order to encounter Christ giving himself to us to nourish us, to, to continue our healing, to encourage us for our sending. I, I don't do, and continue our healing. Look, people, we don't need to be healed, all right? We're spiritually dead until God gives us new life. And so it's vitally important for us to understand this. What he's doing here, because he, he, well, I'm going to be very reformed here and say that we need to gather for the Lord's table um, every week. Uh, I believe that's true. What he's doing is not talking about the Lord's table. Though. It's, it's an act of remembrance. It's that ordinance. It's that sacrament where we remember the sacrifice of Christ. We don't come to the Lord's table for healing. We come to the Lord's table in humility and submission to God. We come to the Lord's table for, for the purpose and for the reason of being reminded of what Christ did on the cross, what he set aside, what he laid down, what he accomplished in his work on the cross, in his active obedience prior to the cross, in his passive obedience in going to the cross, in his, in his burial, in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's why we come to the Lord's table. We identify with him in, in that, um, much in the same way that we identify with his death, burial, and resurrection in baptism. We come and we recognize Christ when we do the Lord's table. We're not coming to the Lord's table for continued healing. Karl Barth, the, the great Reformed theologian with whom I work a great I would not call Karl Barth so, a great Reformed theologian. He's so much theologian. a missional theologian. It's, it's absolutely pervasive in his work. I would Although agree. A lot of Barthians don't know that. Definitely uh, pervasive. Karl Barth talks about the gathering the for the upbuilding resulting in the sending. Uh, uh, he also talks about the in-breathing and exhaling of the church. We gather to breathe in and we go out to exhale gospel. See, there he did it again. We, we gather to breathe in and we go out to exhale gospel. Not the gospel, we go out to exhale gospel. There's a reason why they don't use the definite article here. The gospel. The gospel. The good news. The message. There's a reason. I think all very helpful ways of understanding this, the fundamental rhythm, the fundamental character of the community we call the, the, the church, the gathered people. So uh, when we look at the actual activity of the community, uh, the, the Christian community, however it's configured, I think this will always be uh, what we will claim. We will say this community is gathered as a result of the action of God's Spirit. We've been hearing a lot about the Spirit-driven church. This is a corrective to the idea that is deeply Im uh, embedded in, in us as Westerners that we are in the church because we decided to be. And what we have to work towards in our congregations that our people understand, however you got here, you got here because God acted first. No, notice that. I agree with him. Too many people in the church think that they're there because they got there on their own, that they made the decision. But listen to what he's doing. He's however you got there so he's opening up however you came to the church you're there because god got you there no he it's if you're in the church if you're part of the bride of christ it's through the preaching of the gospel not not just however you got there and, and your response to jesus christ is not something that is a an act of your religious uh, uh capacities it's because god enabled you to understand the work of God, the Word of God, Spirit, and to become uh, a believer. And that's a source of great joy, because it's not dependent upon us, and we know right. that. But it's really hard 
because in America we have this very independent system, an entrepreneurial Agreed. system of church where people have this sense, I choose my church, I support it, and it's mine, right? We have all these churches taking each other to court today about property and, uh, I mean, disobeying scripture at several levels when we do that, but the church is God's. Agreed. And we are enabled to become a part of it, and, and our responsibility when... We are more than enabled to become part of the church. We are predestined, according to, to Ephesians 1 and 2, according to Romans, according to just a ton of other passages in the scripture. We are predest, predestined to be adopted as sons and daughters into the church, to become part of the bride of Christ. We're not just enabled. See, no, notice that, that, that use of the terminology enabled leaves it open. Like, okay, so now you've been enabled. Now you have to do the rest. You have to make that final decision. And so, yes, there's a decision that needs to be made. But what we have to understand is, is that that decision is a foregone conclusion. And he's playing fast and loose with it. And he's about to say something else here that is really disturbing. We're gathered is to draw on all the resources of the Spirit for our mutual formation, encouragement, holding each other accountable, mutual forgiveness, uh, healing, all of this, as we are then sent. And our, and our primary sense of our, who we are as Christians is our existence in the world where we are all apostles. There. Where we are all apostles. We are not all apostles. And I don't care which way you want to twist this, which way you want to slice it, how you want to turn it over, upside down, inside out. We are not all apostles. The office of apostle is gone. We are now witnesses. Yes, I agree with him on that, but we are not all apostles. And so if you want to take issue with me getting bent out of shape about this, this movement using the word apostle, that's fine. Be upset with me about that. You can accuse me of quibbling over words. You can accuse me of, of debating two fine points. But they're using the word apostle in a very particular way. And they are very much doing that intentionally because they do see themselves as a continuation of the apost of, of apostolic authority and ascension. We, do, we don't have that today. Professor Guter is not... An apostle. I'm not an apostle. If you're watching this, you're not an apostle. Um, nobody in your church is an apostle. And if someone says they are an apostle, you need to rebuke them and you need to ask them hard questions like, oh, so tell me about your life with Christ. Tell me how you walked with him as he taught. Tell me about how you suffered with him. Tell me about how you, you were there when they crucified him. Because that's what it would mean, you know, to, in some degree. And he also does something else here. He talks about formation. Um, spiritual formation is um, a wicked uh, teaching that is permeated in the church through men like Richard Foster. And they're really big into spiritual formation. So if you have time, um, do some digging into spiritual formation and see just how pervasive it has come become in the church today. We're all living out the apostolate. So that's, that's about a semester's worth of missional theology in, in the first 20 minutes today. Uh, and I'll just make one other point because I won't get through all five questions and then we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, several uh, emphases, interlocking emphases, have emerged over the last years in this discussion we call a missional theological discussion or the Missional Church Initiative. Uh, and one of them is that we have to spend a lot of time, particularly as Western Christians, say North America, figuring out what the 20 centuries of our so-called Christendom history actually mean today. We heard today about the decline, the unraveling. It's a great way of talking about the end of Christendom. We use the term Christendom, C-H-R-I-S-T-E-N-D-O-M, as the short term for Western so-called Christianized societies and cultures. How, I mean, most people you know would probably still want to describe America as a Christian country, right? I always say, I don't know how you can surf the cable channels of the Agreed. evening and then claim that we're a Christian country, but we're still, people are still doing it. Um, and, I mean, and it is a very complicated history that we cannot deal with in a superficial fashion. We can't go around and say, well, all the generations of Christians before us got it wrong. That's incredibly arrogant and judgmental. But it is complicated. 
So I, I want you to understand that he believes all of the generations that have gone on before us did get it wrong. He believes that they got it right. That they're they're, it's, they're very gnostic. They have a, they have a better understanding. They're more educated. They know things that the early church and others didn't know, and that we lost touch with that very early on. Um, they're very much gnostic. Uh, the language actually reminds me an awful lot of, uh, of the way the, the LDS talks about the, the church. But he's, he's softening it. Well, we can't say it because that would be very arrogant. It would be very condescending. But the whole, the whole time, that's exactly what he's believing. And uh, we, we have the, the histories of racism and anti-Semitism and compromise with violence and all kinds of issues that are... So you listen to what he's doing there. So the church has all this stuff that it's, it, it did wrong. Racism, anti-Semitism, compromise with violence. This is social justice language. So, is racism bad? Absolutely. Racism is horrible. It's condemned in the scriptures. Anti-Semitism is condemned because that's a form of racism. Compromise with violence. I agree. But that's their focus. That's what they're talking about. That's what this the whole mo missional movement is about. It's about social justice. It's not about the gospel. It's about gospel. What's gospel do? Gospel brings justice, but not biblical justice. They would not define justice biblically. A part of our history. And today, if we're going to take our mission field seriously, we have to understand how did this mission field get to be the kind of mission field that it is? Why do we have so many people in America who, if you approach as a Christian, will say, been there, done that. I don't want anything to do with this thing called Christianity. I understand there is a 12-step group that gets together regularly in America called Fundamentalists Anonymous. <laughs> yeah, and they have a 12-step therapy to help people get over that terrible concept. One of the reasons people say, I've been there, I've done that, and I don't want anything to do with this thing called Christianity is because they've been sold a bill of goods. They've been told to come to Jesus because he's going to give you everything you want, because he has a plan for them to not prof hurt them but to prosper them. That that Jesus has a wonderful plan for their lives, and they never heard the true gospel. And that's why then, when, when they reject Christianity, they're not rejecting true Christianity, they're rejecting American Christianity. And Professor Guter of Princeton uh, loves the fact that they're rejecting that. I hate the fact that they have to reject that, because I believe no one really understands just how sparse the wilderness is when it comes to true gospel preaching in the United States. And these people are not preaching the true gospel. They're preaching gospel, but they're not preaching the gospel. Princes are some very oppressive ways of being Christian, and, and they're all there. So you notice they? that? Very oppressive ways of being Christian. They use that language. Oppressive, oppressive, oppressive. Real distortions of the gospel. Oh, there's the so, word, the gospel. Uh, one of the great concerns we have is figuring out what this history is like. And here's where our partnership with our colleagues in England is, is really important because for them, the whole legacy, the historical structure is even, I mean, they still have a doctrine of the apostolic succession of bishops, uh, which we reforms kind of look upon as a, a lovely Catholic myth. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's real, and, it's, and, they, and they are grappling with that history. That's really very helpful for us. No, it's not. Dealing with the history. Another thing we have to be very attentive to then is the character of the community as a biblically formed community. And that's what the theme of this workshop really stresses. How does the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry actually happen? Building on that uh, assumption that the pur purpose of the apostolic mission, if you're on this not, um, this is a process that we call the missional hermeneutical process, for the, if you want the technical word. Don't, don't worry about it, that's fine. It's just one word. Missional hermeneutical um, process. We're making the statement, we, we read the biblical literature Go most and accurately and most apostolic succession of bishops, uh, which we reforms kind of look upon as a, a lovely Catholic myth, uh, but it's it's uh, it's real, and, it's, and they and they are grappling with that history. That's really very helpful for us. No, no, it's not. Dealing with the history, another thing we have to be very attentive to then 
is the character of the community as a biblically formed community. And that's what the theme of this workshop really stresses. How does the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry actually happen? Building on that uh, assumption that the pur purpose of the apostolic mission was the formation of witnessing communities, we then take a next step and uh, this, is, uh, this is a process that, I don't, did I got anything to write with here? I guess not. Um, this is a process that we call the missional hermeneutical process. If, if, if you want the technical word, don't, don't worry about it, that's fine. Missional hermeneutical process. It's just one word. Missional hermeneutical process. Notice that we've created a hermeneutic now where we get to use that hermeneutic for our own purposes and towards our own ends. They have a goal here. They're changing the language of the church, and they're doing it very, in a very calculated way. They have a goal, and it is wicked. We, we have a hermeneutic, um, historical grammatical, or grammatical historical, redemptive historical, those two. Not missional hermeneutical. Mm -mm. Um. We're making the statement, we, we read the biblical literature most accurately and most helpfully when we understand that it was written, that the apostolic purpose, the part purpose of the Gospels was written for Christians, for Christian communities. Just think of, you know, to the Christians in Corinth and to Ephesus and, or, or the Matthean community or the Martin community, whoever they were written to communities to continue their formation to be an apostolic community, to continue their formation as witnesses. This is what the Bible does. This is, this is why we call it apostolic, because it continues apostolic formation. I, I find this a very stimulating way to deal with Scripture. I'm constantly coming to the text, whether it's a gospel, He's going to admit something here that, that and, and I think we, it would be helpful if we would all admit that we come to the text with a set of glasses on that causes us to read the text in a certain way. The, the problem is, is that we have to have in our minds, as we go into it, that we do have presuppositions, but then we have to bring those presuppositions into subjection to the scripture. We don't bring the scriptures into subjection to our presuppositions. He's not going to do that. He is going to bring the scriptures in subjection to his presuppositions, and he's going to twist and shape and mold the scriptures into what he wants it to mean. And he's going to admit that here. Full text or epistle text, or um, as, I, as my, I get a little bit uh, braver with regard to Old Testament texts, even in Old Testament day, there are other scholars who are doing great missional interpretations. See that great missional interpretations of the text. No, we don't need to do missional interpretation of the text. That's not what we're here for. We need to interpret the text the way God intended it to be interpreted according to the, the type and form of the literature that it is. So I, I can read the prophets and I can understand what's being said. I can read the historical books and I can understand what's being said because God had a purpose and a, and a reason for doing what he did in relaying those to us. We don't come to it and say, oh, I'm going to be missional as I read this and I'm going to force meaning into this, because that's what he's doing. Interpretation of the Old Testament. I just haven't specialized in it. But well, I come to the text asking this question. How did this text continue the formation of a witnessing community then? And how does it do that now? And I firmly believe that this is what the Holy Spirit is doing in the church with the scriptural record. That the scriptural record is used by God's Spirit for our formation, which means that as a gathered community, we must focus our attention upon our equipping, upon how it's we as a community, uh, through our encounter with scripture, context. which we help each other do, how we are then equipped to continue being those little flame bearers uh, when we depart from one another. This is a uh, this is uh, in in the theological world in the area of New Testament studies. This is a growing uh, preoccupation. This is a growing uh, interest. We uh, we have. I agree. It is definitely a growing preoccupation. It's not healthy, as most preoccupations aren't. 
but it is a preoccupation. We're finding more and more biblical scholars who are willing to ask that question and, and engage the text, and wanting to know how does this text really shape us, challenges us, challenge us, because we cannot, we cannot become a witnessing community absent that ongoing formation which is empowered by God's Spirit. These are, these are fundamental claims. So uh, I, I would illustrate this with just two brief uh, looks at how the New Testament functions. Look at, uh, if we look at Mark's Gospel, uh, it starts off announcing that it is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's written to a Christian community. The readers of this Gospel already know the story, and they know its outcome. They know that what's coming, going to come is ultimately the suffering, death, and resurrection of our Lord. And the readers are living in the light of the resurrection. What the gospel does, and this is true of all four gospels, although they do it in somewhat different ways. Notice what he does here. So now the gospel are the four gospels. So what the gospel does, and that's all four gospels. The gospel takes the Easter Christian back to the earthly ministry of Jesus and says if you're going to be apostolic witnesses, then you have to go to school with Jesus, as did the first 12 disciples, so that they could be... See what he did there? If you're going to be apostolic witnesses, you have to go back to school with Jesus in his earthly ministry. I don't get to go back to go to school with Jesus. I don't get to walk alongside Jesus as he travels on the Sea of Galilee. I don't get to travel with Jesus the way that he traveled. And no, no one to, today does. Reading the book, as beautiful as it is, does not make us apostolic. He sent after Easter. Remember, none of them became apostles until after Easter. That's, that is Fine. the basic sequence of our formation. That we, we are discipled. Discipleship is not an end in itself. Discipleship is not the reason we do things. Discipleship leads to apostolate. That's why we're... I'm pretty sure that the, the Great Commission says, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and make disciples and baptize them in my name. It doesn't say go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them so that they can become apostles. The end goal of our faith is not to be to just merely disciples. It's to worship God and to be used by God to make other worshipers. But we are not all called to be disciples into the place where we, where we become apostles. Saying so equipping everyday apostles. And our, our discipling process is an day. ongoing uh, grappling with scripture which equips us then to be sent. And uh, in Mark's gospel then we literally learn Jesus. Luke Timothy Johnson has a great book by that title, Learning Jesus. Um, we, we learn how he articulated the good news of God's saving love for the world. We, we learn how he showed it by his actions. We learn that touching lepers is a powerful aspect of our own formation. You hear that? Touching lepers is a powerful aspect of our own formation. I don't even know what that means. He's going to give an attempt here, but if you aren't left scratching your head, I, I, I don't know what will make you scratch your head. Uh, in confusion and, and quite honestly, uh, righteous indignation. Then we have to grapple. What does that mean? What is touching lepers as Jesus? What does touching lepers as Jesus touch lepers mean? Uh, Jesus touched lepers to heal them because they were lepers and they needed healing. Look what he does with this here. Did it mean for us in our world? Where are the lepers that we are called to touch? Where are the lepers that we're called to touch? Um, we're not called to touch lepers, sir. We're not. That's not why we're here. We're not here to touch lepers. We are here to preach the gospel so that lost sinners can get saved through the preaching of the word. Romans chapter 10. How are they going to believe unless they hear? How are they going to hear unless you preach? How are you going to preach unless you're sent? Not as apostles, but as gospel ministers. That's, that's what it means. We don't touch lepers. We don't go out and look for lepers to touch. This is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. This is what the, the seeker-sensitive people do. This is what the whacked-out charismatics do. They, I'm looking for a giant to slay. This is, 
this is just stupid. In fact, it would be, it's so stupid it would be silly if it wasn't so evil. And that, that's, that, that's a very, that can be a very unsettling experience as we encounter the text. It, it, it will raise uh, our consciousness, I think, of all of the ways that we dilute and reduce and take captive the biblical message to make it more um, compatible, to make it more congenial, to make it more doable. My personal contention is that original sin works in the church not by getting us to do bad things, but by getting us to reduce the gospel to a manageable size. To reduce the gospel to a manageable well, size. I want to go back and I think that's that how again. sin works. And learn how he articulated the good news of God's saving love for the world. We, we learn how he showed it. And that, that's, that, that's a very, that can be a very unsettling experience as we encounter the text. It, it, it will raise uh, our consciousness, I think, of all of the ways that we dilute and reduce and take captive the biblical message to make it more um, compatible, to make it more congenial, to make it more doable. My personal contention is that original sin works in the church not by getting us to do bad things, but by getting us to reduce the gospel to a manageable size. Original sin doesn't work by getting us to do bad things. It causes us to reduce the gospel to a manageable size. Uh, this, this is the... Outside of the, uh, the twisting of what it means to be an apostle, this right here is an example of how perverse and wicked this movement is. See, they, they believe the gospel is more than just you are a rotten, wicked sinner who has no hope of salvation apart from Christ. Until you repent and believe the gospel message, cast yourself at the foot of the cross. And believe only on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. You are you are utterly without hope. They they think that's a reductionism of the gospel, and they believe that's a result of sin in our lives. But that is the pure gospel. So these guys not only are they gnostic in their approach, they're progressive in their theology. They are also preaching another gospel, and and that other gospel is a social justice agenda. It's disgusting and it's evil. It has no place in the church. To reduce the gospel to a manageable size. I think that's how sin works in the church. So uh, I'm, I'm eager to have my biblical colleagues help us to learn how to preach and teach the text so that we're encountering the text as um, this formative word. My, my theory is that the actual canonic authority of Scripture is basically missional. But the texts that are adopted by the early church are the texts which God's Spirit most consistently was using in the apostolic history for the continuing formation of witnessing communities. Uh, I had thought I would take the time and, and illustrate a bit of this by looking at a few texts in Philippians, but I don't know for sure that we have that much time. and We've only got 12 or 13 minutes left, so let me just stop there and open it up for conversation. Uh, have I tread on toes? Do I need to repeat something or explain it? Uh, I, 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 as I did, unloaded a lot quickly. Uh, my wife always tells me I tend to over answer questions. So, what, uh, what comments or questions do you have about what we're saying? And I'd be really interested if you see connections between what we're talking about here and the whole thrust of the French Expressions engagement that we're all in, in, in really finding so wonderful in this conference. Yes? Well, I, I love Philippians because it becomes very clear in Philippians. Thank you for giving permission to go back to my agenda. Um, Philippians uh, is, first of all, if you read it carefully, makes it very clear that the, that the community in Philippi understood itself as continuing the apostolic mission. Paul is counting on that. So he talks, he, he, he talks to them about how they have shared with him in his par partnership with him from the very beginning how they are witnesses in Rome. I mean, they're just, so this, the sense of the Philippians, we continue Paul's mission, or we continue the apostolic mission, uh, is, I think, clearly in the text if you're looking for it. And then you find in there, you find uh, thematically, I think, some really important uh, biblical emphases. The central theme of Philippians is uh, chapter 1, verse 27, um, 
and I always have to retranslate this, the, the only is not a strong enough word. It should be translated something like, now pay attention to what I'm about to say, because I'm going to make a really important point. That's all wrapped up around the word monon. Uh, this is the point. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, this is a theme in Paul, worthiness of the gospel. It comes about five or six times. I don't hear it. I have never heard a scholarly discussion of it. It needs to happen. Um, this is a very interesting one because in all the other passages, you think of the theme. I don't know who he's been listening to if he's never heard a scholarly um, exp explanation of what it means to to make our lives worthy of the gospel of Christ but he's clearly not listening to sound teachers uh, because every sound teacher that I know that's that's the brunt of their teaching is to live your lives in such a way that it's worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ this is just maddening and saddening at the same time Ephesians 4 1 lead your life worthy of the calling which you've been called all the other passages the the word uh, is uh, for that's used is to, to walk, to walk your life, to live your life as an ongoing pilgrimage. In this text, Philippians 1.27, the word, the operative word, is the same root as politics. And what it means is lead your public life, what the world sees because you're there, in a way worthy of the gospel of Christ. This is, I think, a very, very key instruction for equipping everyday apostles. The assumption is that we do live publicly, that our Christian our Christian vocation is not secret. That we may we, 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 we may find ourselves in social and political situations where certain kinds of public expression are not possible, but we're still living there. Even even notice notice the emphasis here on on now you just live the gospel. That, that, that's what he's pointing at. You just live at the gospel. And as I said in, a, as I said in an article that's going to be coming out on my website pretty soon, uh, when you say you're living the gospel, you're actually blaspheming Christ. This man is, is blaspheming all over the place. The Christian in, um, say, in an in a, in a Islamic country that doesn't permit public Christian witness, there are Christians in all those countries, they have to lead their lives as evidence even though they can't say anything. That's that's bull. It's bull. No one gets saved apart from the preaching of the gospel. No one. So even if you live in a country where it's you, you're not allowed to have a public expression, you still have to preach the gospel. Otherwise, people can't get saved. God uses the gospel as a means by which people come to salvation. Romans 1 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paraphrase. No one gets saved apart from the proclamation of the gospel. You can't just live it. No one's going to get saved from watching you. I don't care how holy and righteous you are. You just can't. And this is a really important aspect of their formation. What does that worthiness look like? I would suggest Reference to that formation when we're again. together as the gathered church, one of our tasks together is to figure out what is worthy witness? What is the worthy witness that you carry out as a school teacher in a secular school system? Or the, the worthy witness. Every single one of us, no matter what our vocation might be in the secular world, we live out a worthy witness by being the best employee that we can be at any given moment of the time. And when we fail, we confess our failure to the people we work around. That's our worthy witness. In, in that Christ motivates and the gospel informs how we respond. But it does not mean we're preaching the gospel. If you want to be a witness to Christ, you have to open your mouth and preach the gospel. It's not just how you live. Because if it was just how you live, there are thousands of moral people in the world right now who probably do more for their culture, do more for their society, and more for their communities than I will ever do by way of kindness and volunteering. But they never preach the gospel. Because they don't know the gospel. What is the worthy witness that you as a business person carry out where your competitor, by biblical definition, is your neighbor? And what are you going to do about that? 
Those treat are them hard questions. with love and preach and the gospel are, to them. easy answers to them. But this is the central theme of the entire epistle. Lead your public life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's then fleshed out. You get in, in the beginning of chapter 2, you get this wonderful instruction. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any incentive of love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy. This is addressed to the whole group. By being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do you need any more emphasis that it's important for Christians to live in unity with one another? So how do we just... I want to go back to earlier when you talked about how the church is suing each, each other and there's all this unchristian behavior. And I agree there is a ton of unchristian behavior. But what they talk about with unity here is strictly always love all the time. And love is defined by never being in disagreement. Ever. You can be in disagreement. So right now... Biblically, the most loving thing for me to do is to tell and warn people about the danger of this man. He and others, in fact, people that I know that I've been in close contact with, would tell me that I'm being unloving because I'm talking about how mis wrong this is and how they're mishandling it. And, and that we have to have unity. We can't. We can't have unity with people who don't preach sound doctrine. Unity is built up around, one, a love for Christ, two, the preaching of sound and the teaching of sound doctrine. Without the preaching and teaching of sound doctrine, there can be no unity. And the divisive person is not the person who comes in and says, look, this is wrong. The divisive person who comes in and says, hey, try this because I like it. That's divisiveness bringing false doctrine into the church, allowing false doctrine to enter into the church, that's divisiveness. That is not true unity. True unity is gathering around the preaching of the gospel, the reading of the word, and teaching sound doctrine. That is what true Christian unity looks like. Defy, in the Presbyterian church, everybody splitting and going in different directions. It's an act of blatant disobedience. No, it's not. If someone's splitting away from a mainline Presbyterian denomination over doctrinal issues, they're ordaining homosexuals. They're ordaining women into roles as pastors and elders. If they're allowing blatant sin to happen, if they're teaching false doctrine, they need to split. They need to mark those people and they need to put them away. That is not blatant disregard for the Bible. That's not sin. People in sin are the ones who are allowing the disunity through false doctrine. That's the sin. That's the disunity. Not the person who's proclaiming, look, we need to stand on truth. Sure. And we're in a passage right now, a tragic passage in the Presbyterian Church, where we're not only splitting and therefore, I think, rendering our witness virtually invalid, but we're justifying. So at this point, the equipping word becomes a very challenging word. That at least we Presbyterians have to take very seriously. Paul's prayer for the uh, Philippian community is, I think, this, one of the central statements on the ongoing formation of witnessing congregations. The ninth verse. My prayer is that your love, again, this is plural, it's the shared love, the public character of love, that your love may increase or abound more and more with all knowledge and discernment. Paul's making it very clear that the love he's talking about, which is what is exposed in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, that that love is, uh, is instructive. It teaches us to think a different way. That, that this love brings its own knowing with it, and it's a knowing that profoundly shapes our deciding, which he then says, uh, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all in discernment, so that you all together may approve, may decide as a, a process of, of Christian discernment what is truly excellent. I love how he uses the term Christian discernment here. It's ironic. Because no one with discernment is going to hear anything that men like him and David Briscoe, or excuse me, Brad Briscoe teach, who has no one who has discernment is going to hear these guys and not have red flags pop up all over the place. And this is our challenge constantly. How what does Christian witness look like in our society? How, how does a Christian community 
display the character of Christ reign when we are all shaped by consumerism to the degree that we are. And that's something that we have to figure out. That's something we're... If we are witnesses by preaching the gospel to lost people. That's how we're witnesses. And then we live our lives in such a way so that when we preach the gospel, our lives commend the gospel message. I think it was Spurgeon who said, Let the hypocrite, let the man who loves his sin, go out from his house, turn down the street, and walk to the next town and before he opens his mouth to preach. And let him keep on walking, but never let him preach. If your life's not reflecting the gospel, don't preach the gospel. And that could be said for all of us, but what he's talking about here is not gospel ministry. But if that love, informed love, is growing, we will be enabled to help each other figure that out. That's what I think Paul is, is talking about here. That's, I think, the kind of emphasis that comes out of engaging the scripture, asking this question, how did this text at that time form continue the formation of witnessing communities and how does it do that today other uh yes you mentioned i'm sitting here as an old testament professor thinking how can you read the old testament missionally i mean some you could christopher wright has done it something yeah i've seen the christopher wright book um I like the fact that this guy asked how do you read the old testament missionally it gets so complicated in the polity of Israel that yeah. it becomes closest inward. I think you have to have a, I think you, you do it from a, yes, one last question. Here we go. On the term apostle, yes. um, in, in, uh, sometimes I see it misused. Yes. Um, um, people you know, calling themselves apostles, but you wonder what exactly are they. This, this guy's sharp. I don't know if he buys his argument here that's coming up, but he's sharp. Are they meaning by their self-reference? Yeah. You know. I, so, what can you say about that? And the other thing is, in, you said that we should use the term that, that yeah. we should all be apostles because right. we are all called to be right. apostles uh, or disciples to that end. Yeah. But what's your um, thinking on when, when Paul speaks about the gifts? And, you know, are they all apostles? So what you when he when he speaks in First Corinthians twelve and he's but those he's there there he's speaking about spiritual gifts these are these are capacities of people to share but in, yeah I love how everybody's cr critiquing him this gal says well he means Ephesians four eleven no this guy knows what he's talking about Ephesians four eleven is a very important text that some well, his well, gift was First Corinthians twelve. 29. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Yeah. I know it's speaking about yeah. the gift. Oh, I see the yeah, okay. But but just just I'm just interested. Yeah, we don't we don't use the term to make the claim that somehow we are a part of that exclusive community. We make the Notice what he did here? He just spent a ton of time talking about how we're all part of the apostolic community. But well now now that he got called on it, now that he got questioned about it, well we're not all part of that community term to say we are continuing its story we are defined by the same purpose and that's of course the work of god's spirit he backtracks i, can, so I would fast. say we can use the word apostle if we use it for everyone or if we say we are all defined as a part of the apostolate in other words, I, I make the noun for the person into a definition of the purpose of the whole church in the sense of the priesthood of all of you exactly the apostolate of all christians notice that this man says, in the sense of the priesthood of all believers, and he says, yes, the apostolate of all believers. They're different. They're absolutely different. And I'm, I'm not going to play anymore. There's only a few minutes left. I've already gone. I mean, right now I'm looking at my timer, and I'm at an hour and 20 minutes. I'm sure it'll be a little bit shorter when I'm done editing it. But my point is, these guys have a very dim view of of scripture and what scripture teaches they have an overinflated view of the importance of man they believe that they can do whatever they want with the twisting of scripture and say things like well an apostle is just a messenger yes in in the greek understanding of the word yes but in the biblical understanding of the word no an apostle is not just merely a messenger an apostle was a, a, a direct main source of information from Jesus Christ because these people had contact with him in ways that we cannot imagine. So to say that we're all somehow apostles is utter evil. It's utter evil. 
It's a rejection of of what the church has taught for the last 2,000 years. And I know that there are some who would disagree with me on that, that there's some within the Church of England and, and Roman Catholicism, but that's fine. You can disagree, but we do not have apostolic authority. We do not have apostolic ascension. We are not an apostolic community. We are the called out ones. And we learn from what the apostles taught us in the New Testament. And we are supposed to embrace the doctrines that they taught and we're supposed to teach them. Over and over and over again, this professor has demonstrated himself to be an enemy of the faith. And yet Brad Briscoe relies on him for the formation of his book, for a lot of different parts of his book. He quotes him several times. These are who the people that Brad Briscoe affiliates with. You know a man by his friends. And when I say you know a man by his friends, I'm not saying you can't have lost friends. What I'm saying is is that if you're claiming to be a representative of Christ, if you're claiming to be a teacher in the name of Christ, and you come along and you teach things that do not comport with sound doctrine, you are a wolf. Brad Briscoe is a wolf. Daryl Guter is a wolf. I don't care if he's a professor at Princeton. I would tell this to him to his face. And I'll say again, if you allow this kind of stuff to come into your church, you are not doing your job. I'm pleading with you, brother, in Christ, if you're an elder, please do not allow this into your church. I beg you. This, this whole movement is an enemy of the true church. I'm pleading with you. Please, in the name of God, for the love of all that's holy, don't do this.